This episode is sponsored by Vulture, high-performance cloud compute, bare metal, and storage in 25 locations all over the world. Sign up and get $200 free credit to use in 30 days at getvultr dot com slash ldt. Hello and welcome to episode 48 of Linux Downtime. I'm Joe. I'm Kyle. And I'm Martin. Thanks for joining me again, Martin. And thanks for joining us for the first time, Kyle. Nice to be here. Thanks for having me. I should probably get you to introduce yourself. So uh, who are you? Right. So I'm a software engineer at a contracting company called Miriam Technologies. Um, My background, though, was working with Martin at Canonical. I started out working at Canonical in Unity 8. Um, That didn't last terribly long before we moved into (laughs) Snaps. And uh, and then I started uh, taking ownership of the robotics work at Canonical. So that's, that's my general background. So Martin, it was your idea to have Kyle join us. Yeah, it was. I saw a couple of weeks ago that Kyle had a sort of a lamenting tweet thread about the state of the Linux desktop. And Kyle, I'm going to ask you what you were lamenting in just a moment. But as that tweet was published, Joe and I were discussing this very topic for a podcast. And the topic that I proposed was reimagining the Linux desktop. And I thought your tweet was very timely because it wasn't a technical lament at all. So for the benefit of the listeners, what were you describing, you know, a few weeks ago on Twitter? This was in response to a tweet that I saw Popey make, which was in response to another tweet complaining about the version of, I believe it was Yarn, in Ubuntu. I'm using the newest Ubuntu release, and this thing is ancient. Why? And Popey's response was, well, it's in universe, which is a valid response. But my thread was, no one knows what that means anymore. (laughs) So Ubuntu is, in some ways, a victim of its own success. It's done a really good job of making it easy to use. And so as Linux gets easier and easier, it's only natural that the average technical knowledge in the user base drops. And that's a great thing. But unless you're aware that it's happening, it can cause some issues. And, and I, think, I think that's happening in Ubuntu. No one knows what main or universe is. And, and ultimately, it turns into no one knows where their software is coming from and how it's supported, if it's supported. In fact, if they apt install something, I am willing to bet they just assume it's supported. And that's really just not the way it works in Ubuntu. And so Popey's response was correct, but it really shows that there is a lack of understanding there. Main, if you install software from main, you get guarantees about how that software is supported. Generally, it's it's supported by Canonical. You're guaranteed to get security backports, um, bug fixes, that type of thing. And then there's Universe, which is community-supported stuff. Yes, Canonical employees will sometimes take ownership of you know pet projects in there, right? But for the most part, those things are either automatically synced from Debian and dumped there because Canonical doesn't want to take ownership of it in main, or they're maintained in general by a community that, let's be honest, is shrinking. Mm-hmm. People don't generally put things there anymore or update them. And so when you apt install Yarn and it comes from Universe, yeah, it can be super ancient. Even if it's up to date, though, who's maintaining it? You don't actually know because it's it's in Universe. So everything that you've said is quite accurate. And, you know, I now firmly put myself in that group of people that help maintain packages in Universe. And the very fact that we're talking about a package repository called Universe, I think highlights <laughs> your point, right? It's not like mac os where you install the operating system and the operating system updates itself and it's not like windows where you install the operating system and the operating system updates itself despite what you might think about how those updates are like moderated by the by the update facilities and there is a disconnect between where the support lies but what i took away from your thread was there are more people coming to Linux than ever before. And I think that that is true, despite the fact that it's not, you know, it's not a deluge of people. It is a steady trickle of new adopters. But their expectations are very different from the decades-long technical understanding that 
comes before all of that. Absolutely. And so what I read in is from what you were describing is how do we, the Linux community, particularly the Linux community that's interested in making desktop Linux, actually make Linux more accessible to the masses. And this is not the masses that your average Linux YouTuber will talk about, where they seem to think complete beginners exist that have never used a computer in their life, and then one day decide that they're going to install Linux with no understanding of how computers work. But developers and users and computer enthusiasts that decide they want to try something different. So you're talking about the kind of person who has probably built their own PC before, knows what a graphics card is, understands the difference between a spinning Rust hard drive and an SSD. You think that's who we should be targeting? Yeah, I think so. And I think if we were to... I think I think it's that group and another group. I think it's developers. Developers are people too. <laughs> but developers are increasingly like the Linux desktop audience. And I think then we can also classify what you've just described, Joe, as computer enthusiasts. Maybe they haven't built their own PC yet, but maybe they watch or know enough about PC hardware that they could if they had the means to do so. But they're interested in how computers work and function. And for me, I was doing that some time ago, and therefore installing Linux was an extension of that interest in how the hardware worked. So that was going to be one of my questions. Who are we aiming this at? So you are suggesting that if we reimagine the Linux desktop, we're going to pretty much exclude people who are brand new to computers. You, you don't think that that is a realistic option, that someone who's only ever used a phone, say, is going to buy a laptop with Linux pre-installed and start using it? I think that you've qualified that in the latter part of that question. But my first assertion is there is nobody today that is new to computers, even our parents and our grandparents have become accustomed to computers and everyone that is younger than us has grown up with computers, computing devices of all shapes and sizes. So there is nobody in the developed nations and the emerging economies that has not had access to computers in some way, shape or form. But I think Kyle's point was interesting, which is how does desktop Linux actually fit in alongside the mainstream offerings in a way that makes sense, that is not friction and full of jargon, because it's not technical jargon, because these are technically astute people. This is my assertion. It's jargon from the Linux world. Well, yeah, and in uh, well, in this particular case from the, the Debian and Ubuntu world, I mean, every Linux distribution has kind of its own version of this, and the, the, the provenance of software is really unclear. And one of the points I made in this thread was, it seems to be getting worse with new packaging formats, right, where you've got Flatpak and Snap, and then you've got the software center exposing Flatpaks, Snaps, and Debs all alongside each other. Sometimes you don't even know what you're installing. Oh, I want this piece of software. It, not only do you not know if it came from main or universe, but it could have come from any number of these other places as well. And so the situation is not improving. And sometimes even when you apt install something, you end up with a snap. <laughs> <laughs> so what you've both just said, I think is perfect because this shouldn't even be a discussion. If you're on Android, you don't have to have an affiliation with the packaging format, the way that the software is delivered or your preference for software stores. There is one software store. I know if Phelan were here, he would tell us there are others. But, you know, for the billions of Android users and iOS users, there is one store for each of those platforms. And that is how all software is consumed and distributed. And the fact that we have software centers that feel like they have to inform their users as to whether they're about to install a Deb, an app image, a flat pack, or a snap, that kind of highlights the immense brokenness in user experience for desktop Linux. Because 
We all understand that because we've got years and years of assumed knowledge and we know this language and we know the implications of making those choices. But those shouldn't be choices that we push down to people who just want to get stuff done. They shouldn't need to know. They just want the software. I agree. But if you abstract those types of things away, let's assume that the situation remains the same, but there are two ways to present it to the user, right? One is either, okay, you can install this piece of software via a flat pack, a snap or a deb, which I agree is a terrible UX, right? But it's also a terrible UX to just make a choice for them because ultimately those are supported in different ways by different people and they don't even know what they just installed, right? And so neither of those situations is, is great. Right. Okay, this episode is sponsored by Collide. Go to K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash L-D-T to sign up today. Collide sends employees important, timely, and relevant security recommendations for their Linux, Mac, and Windows devices right inside Slack. Collide is perfect for organizations that care deeply about compliance and security, but don't want to get there by locking down devices to the point where they become unusable. Instead of frustrating your employees, Collide educates them about security and device management while directing them to fix important problems. Collide helps deal with some of the many issues that are not solved by locking down devices, like instructing developers to set passphrases on unencrypted SSH keys, finding plain text two-factor backup codes and teaching end users how to store them securely, and convincing employees to uninstall evil browser extensions that may sell their browser history. You can try Collide with all its features on an unlimited number of devices, free for 14 days, no credit card required. Try it out at collide.com slash L-D-T. That's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash L-D-T. We've started with the quintessential Linux desktop argument, which is a discussion about package managers and which package managers are best. But let's try and pivot away from this because this was reimagining desktop Linux. And let's imagine we're now in a world where only one way of installing software exists. I feel like this points the light towards a desktop future built on an immutable operating system base and containerized application delivery using one of several <laughs> options, unfortunately. But let's just bury the fact several options exist. I would make a play that that meeting of desktop and container technologies is the only way, the way that Linux, the Linux desktop will be viable in the future. I think that paints over a lot of difficult details. <laughs> I, I think it does. Um, so come on, what are some of the difficult details with that story? Well, libraries. So uh, coming from a, a Snap background, right? I think these containerized applications work really well for Leaf applications. But when it comes down to sharing libraries, the whole story oftentimes collapses really quickly because you can't really ship those in a nice way. They can be consumed by multiple containers without getting out of date. Or there's a number of difficulties there that I don't think anyone has really overcome. Yeah, but I think you're making an argument there from the perspective as a developer that understands the nature of libraries and how they age and decay. If you're an end user, why do you care a fig about any of that stuff? You know, you just install your application and it runs forevermore by magic. You know, do you care that there's a library inside there somewhere specific to that app that is dated and old? What would be the common, like today's problem of, of being able to play your MP3s? Back in the day, when I installed a Linux distribution, I just wanted my MP3s to play. But that was actually really difficult to do on a lot of them until I got to Ubuntu, which just gave me a little checkbox on the installer, right? Yeah, just, I, I want that. And so historically, I mean, coming from Ubuntu's Linux for human beings type of background, they've done a really good job at that. If you continue down that road of sort of abstracting these details, I think that's really useful for getting people up and running. But I think you can take that too far. When you start saying, I want to embed libssl in all of these applications, and my users shouldn't have to care. You're right. Ideally, they, they wouldn't have to care. But ultimately, you're making them use a piece of software that could very well be insecure. Not only do they have no choice over that, they have no insight into that. 
Okay. And is it about users? I mean, if we look at Mac OS, for example, Mac OS is very opinionated about the decisions that they make that impact developers, the people that are shipping their applications, and they routinely run up against these flag days where there's a new version of Mac OS and now their software doesn't work and the developers, it's, it, it's on, it's the onus of the developer in order to uplift their application to support new version of Mac OS. So which side of the fence do you come down on that? Is is that a good developer experience, a good user experience or? No, you're right. It's, it's really neither. In that situation, the user isn't able to get this piece of software until it's rewritten by the developer to actually work properly. So it's not a good story for either of them. Yeah. And at that point, now you need to know what version of Mac OS you're running and you need to know as a user whether or not the software you want to install is compatible with the version of Mac OS that you have and that you can upgrade safely. And there's only one way to find out, which is to upgrade and then find out where the broken bits are (laughs) exactly. We call that a scream test. (laughs) (laughs) So this is why I feel like the container-based technologies, I'm not necessarily saying it's Snap or Flatpak, but I feel like the container technologies are taking things in the right direction because you don't have to think about that breakage in terms of the developer or the user, right? You can upgrade your operating system and your applications continue to function. And the other thing that I see is that with now a career that is very much a part of like the container technology landscape, I have to see the massive investment that all of those technologies get from untold number of organizations. If desktop Linux is to succeed, surely we want to be riding on the back of all of that investment and capability. I think that despite my misgivings, you are right. I think that that is ultimately the future. I'm not exactly sure how we get there and how we solve all the problems. Because if you look at the mobile space, if you look at something like Android, you have a user problem with containerized applications of data sharing between those applications. And on Android, you have intents, the the share menu. And that's what most users are used to, at least on the, the consumer end of things. Do we need something like that? to solve the problem of containerization rather than just doing a, a, you know, dash dash classic confinement or whatever in snaps. Yes, Joe, I think you're right that an intense like system in Linux is absolutely what we need. And we have some of that already. And I know this is something that Kyle has worked on and contributed to in the past. Martin's right. I have contributed to uh, content sharing in in Snaps in particular. Now, my knowledge is a year out of date at this point. But one of the things we were trying to solve was content sharing in a, in a confined manner. And the way Snaps are doing it is, is essentially bind mounting from one into another. The development flow of that was never particularly great. Um, it, it was incredibly complex. One of the reasons we we're okay with that, at least for the time being, is because things were moving towards portals, which starts leaving my area of expertise. But Martin, have you dealt with those at all? Yeah, I have. So only at a cursory level, but let's just touch on what this is. This is a free desktop specification called Portals that enables confined applications, be they Flatpak or Snaps, because Both groups of developers are contributing to this standard, this specification, and this main means of exchanging data. This is what could be not an exact analog for intents as we know it in Android, but for that kind of capability that you know this application wants to share its copy-based buffer. It wants to be able to take screenshots. It wants to be able to share video and audio, for example. This is what desktop portals are designed to do. It's quite a rich feature set of capabilities. It's not complete. And certainly, if you look at the work that's been done with OBS Studio and making OBS Studio into a flat pack and the portal support it has and the back end support that had to be added in order to accommodate that, it's all moving in the right direction. But there is work to be done. But I think this is the agreed standard that everyone's working towards. 
I think most of the the portal work that I've seen is is really just around content. I have seen and have tried mm-hmm. to abuse content sharing in a in a library sharing way and, and that and that whole story doesn't work very well because there's really no way to control what version you're getting and all of a sudden the connection itself has to carry so much metadata that you're just trading one set of problems for another. Okay, this episode is sponsored by Vulture. Go to getvulture.com slash LDT to sign up and get $200 free credit to use in 30 days. Vulture offers high-performance cloud compute, bare metal, and storage in 25 locations all over the world. You can pick from 12 operating systems, including Windows, or you can bring your own ISO. Vulture's Marketplace offers one-click installation of more than 50 applications and operating systems, including Minecraft and other game servers, VoIP and VPN platforms, content management systems like WordPress, and cPanel. Also, check out their optimized plans, CPU, memory, and storage optimized instances featuring the latest AMD Epic chips. So go to getvulture.com slash LDT to get your $200 credit and support the show. That's G-E-T-V-U-L-T-R dot com slash L-D-T. Bit of admin then. First of all, thank you everyone who supports us with PayPal and Patreon. We really do appreciate that. You can find out more at linuxdowntime.com slash support. And for $10 or more per month on Patreon, you can get an advert-free RSS feed that includes this show, Linux After Dark, and Late Night Linux. And if you want to get in contact with us, you can email show at linuxdowntime.com. So we haven't talked about the desktop itself, the actual user interface. Now, Martin, you are very much a Mate advocate and user. I am an XFCE advocate and user. Kyle, I believe you use just uh, the GNOME desktop on Ubuntu. That's correct. So... The question is, what interface are we going to go with? Are we just going to say that we want one common interface, one desktop, and just stick to that? Or are we going to go with flavors? I think we have to decide that first. So I would throw this question back at you, Joe, as somebody that is famously a Linux Luddite, and as you point out, a diehard XFCE user. What is your vision of desktop Linux into the future? And please don't tell me that it's setting your background to black and turning off all animations like you do on your phone. (laughs) And my desktop. No, (laughs) clearly GNOME is where we need to be. I think that the major distros have chosen GNOME for actually quite good reasons. There is a big caveat coming, but I think that when you look at GNOME in terms of its usability, its accessibility features and its general development. It's had a lot of money thrown at it and it's in a good place, but there is a fundamental problem with it and that is that it keeps changing. And I think that is where we need to change it. I think that we need to pick a version of GNOME and either fork it off and maintain that or change something to mean that it doesn't change all the time and just accept that it's working well now and let's build on top of where we are now. There was quite a lot to unpack there, but I'll start with this first question. Is that not sunk cost fallacy? Yes and no. I think that it's sunk cost fallacy to stick with GNOME and GTK development and try and keep pace with it. Because what's the alternative? You you start totally from scratch and just do the typical Linux thing of invent a new thing and it's just a bit rubbish for ages. Okay. My second point is the recent changes to GNOME, I think, have got it headed in a direction that more people would identify with. If we look at the mainstream platforms, which I'm going to qualify as Windows and Mac OS, they are not complete departures away from the traditional desktop metaphor. And GNOME was. GNOME 3 was. Yeah. Yeah. But GNOME is now pivoting back towards something that is more traditional desktop, not the metaphor, but at least in the basic use and operation, it is a lot more like a traditional desktop operating system. And I feel like that's a good thing. I, you know, you look at what iOS does when you attach a trackpad and a keyboard. It doesn't continue operating like a phone. It starts operating like a desktop workstation. You just want everyone to use Mate. Just admit it. 
actually no, and I'll qualify this. Mate is good for me, and it's good for people like me that think that the Range Rover Defender is the pinnacle of utilitarian vehicles, right? If that's what you want to drive around in and is your daily driver, then yes, that's what Mate Desktop is. But when I worked at Canonical, there was a conversation, you know, during that period in 2017, pivoting away from Unity, what are we going to use next? I was surveyed on that. I absolutely didn't volunteer Mate. In fact, I've been in many conversations with leadership at Canonical where Mate came up for sponsorship for various projects. And I said, we really can't afford to do this. In those conversations, I always fell down on the side of the fence for KDE and Plasma. Right. And Plasma is great insofar as it is really configurable. You can make it whatever you want. But I would argue that most people don't really want that. Because if you look at Mac OS and Windows, Windows, you can configure a lot more than a Mac or more easily. But KDE is too configurable for a mass audience, I would argue. I know that KDE people would uh, disagree with me, but GNOME is very much, here's what it is, use it or don't. And I think that's what we need for mass adoption. But at the same time, I think you have to have the option to switch it out, like you can with Fedora Silverblue right now. You can swap out that GNOME very, very easily for Plasma and I think some other desktops as well. And they're all working to a certain degree. But I think that you need to have that option. But I also think that complex configuration options should have to be unlocked. Much like on Android, you have to go to build number and tap it five times to get into your developer options. I think that you've got to have that, but have a scary warning. I think that's fine. Uh, you know, it's like on Android, if you want to install applications not from the Play Store, you can do it, but it says mm, you probably shouldn't do this unless you know what you're doing. And I think. That is the solution. I think bury it in options that people have to probably search Google to find how they're going to do it and then give them that configurability. But out of the box by default, keep it simple and make it hard for them to break. So I, I agree. One of one of the difficulties I've had with KDE is is just getting lost in, in options. And I, I have come to value opinions, even if I don't agree with them. Using something that's opinionated means that I have some expectation of 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 how this system is going to work, right? Especially if you take that view to the entire desktop system. And so I, I do agree with that. However, I will point out that Joe, you talk about how GNOME is moving very quickly, right? And it and it will break. Mm. And I think to your point of potentially forking it and solidifying that, you what you're you're not really talking about GNOME at that point, right? It, it, you're going to end up with something that's customized with a million plugins, kind of like Canonical has done. Mm. And so it, what you're proposing and, and what you're saying are, are slightly different things, it feels like. Yeah. If you disagree with the sort of the KDE philosophy, which is give the users all of the options all of the time, then pick a platform that developers are stacking up behind right now. And maybe, and this is where I'm going to upset Joe. Maybe we do need something new, or maybe we need something new built on an emerging technology stack where developers live. And I would suggest that that could be Flutter. Oh, no. I knew you were going to say Flutter. Let's look at what he could have said, right? JavaScript? <laughs> yeah. I could have listed endless JavaScript framework libraries. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> But I didn't state Electron. You know, the, the one of the advantages of Flutter, of course, is it's it's compiled and everything is GL accelerated, right? You know, it is it is not Electron. So you're saying throw it all away and start again with an emerging technology which Google is behind. Well, why not? If you're going to throw your lot in, why don't you throw your lot in with the largest growing community of developers out there? Like try and pivot to where all major mobile application development is happening to capitalize on that momentum to bring all of that application to support 
to what is the Linux desktop. Hang on, he said Flutter, not Swift. (laughs) (laughs) Is there a risk in following a developer community like that, Martin? Because there's new hotness all the time. By the time you actually get up and running on Flutter, a vast chunk of that community could be on some completely new tech. I mean, that's sort of your risk of choosing an emerging tech. Whereas you, you, I want to come back to something you talked about with KDE, because I, I didn't really share my opinions here. While I'm fine using GNOME, and I'm not a huge fan of KDE, I love Qt, and I'm not a huge fan of GTK. And I thought you were talking about building on top of something like Qt, which I think is excellent. It has a bit of a shaky history in terms of ownership and maintainership, but I think it's an awesome toolkit that we could build on. Licensing problems as well, right? Mm. Not so much these days, but that was my point. And I did kind of throw Flutter in there to be sort of devil's advocate to a large extent. But really, that argument between Qt and GTK kind of underscores my point, which is if you're going to attract people to your platform, use technologies that they're already familiar with or are so close to the industry paradigms that it's an easier lift. Because if you're a developer and you know GTK, as I do, you understand how very different it is from everything else that's out there and why If you were a developer within an organization and you wanted to bring your application to a Linux audience, you're going to have to do it in a way that's a lightweight lift. And that either means, you know, Electron or one of the applications that's familiar with what you're doing or, you know, something that's more industry standard. And look at where Qt has been successful. You know, uh, we look at OBS Studio, for example. You know, that's a really great example of an application where on Linux we enjoy feature parity, it's built on Qt. And yes, there is obviously abstraction for the three major platforms. In fact, four, because BSD is even supported as well by (laughs) OBS Studio. But the fact that it's Qt means that lots of people can contribute to that. There's an awful lot of familiar ground there for a lot of developers. Well, we'd better wrap it up, but I feel like we could continue this conversation for a couple more hours here. Kyle, thank you very much for joining us. It's been great. And uh, we'll have to have you on again at some point to talk more about this, I think. Oh, my pleasure. Anytime. Yeah. Thanks, Kyle. And I would say to Joe, maybe this was part one. Maybe we've just dug into like the, the technical nitty gritty here and maybe the wider conversation about what the future of desktop Linux could look like is, is yet to be examined. And if you feel the same way, send your feedback to show at linuxdowntime.com and maybe the three of us can get together and like dig into the actual desktop experience a bit more sounds good well thanks gents and we'll see everyone in a couple of weeks <laughs>